Hi everybody and welcome to the next episode of It's a Fair Question. Today I've come down to the Scottish borders and I'm meeting Marion Hutchison. Marion's son Scott was the lead singer, the songwriter, the guitarist with the Scottish band Frightened Rabbit and very tragically Scott chose to end his life in May 2018. This is a very difficult subject, but a very real subject in Scotland today. Marion, thank you so much for being willing to meet with me today and to chat. Let me begin by asking you, who was Scott? Scott was probably best known as the lead singer-songwriter in the Scottish band Frightened Rabbit. Scott took his life in May 2018 after a battle with anxiety, depression and, and sometimes fear. But to me and to his family and to his close friends, Scott was just the most creative, the funniest, the most honest and the kindest person that I've ever met. Obviously, to the public, he was Scott, lead singer of the band. But to you, he was your boy. Tell me what he was like when he was young. He... Scott has... He, he, he would tell me that he actually he enjoyed his childhood. It was it, it was a happy. He was he grew up in Selkirk, uh, me and his dad and older brother Neil, younger brother Grant, um, and he was very much of a family person. He felt safe and loved you know, as part of the family and the family home. Um, he was very quickly realised that he was is he he was very very creative. Um, his, his drawings and his artwork were from a very, very early age were amazing. We thought he was shy, chronically shy. It, it turned out to be a lot more than that. Um, he was he was very agile, wee boy. He liked to play sports, some sports, mm. not all of them. Um, he, um, he 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 loved. Music. He, he he discovered music um, in the in Selkirk High School. Although there was always music around the house, there was always, uh, or if we went long car journeys, there was always music playing, and uh, you know, on, on a tape in those days. Um, and he he learned to play the guitar at Selkirk High. It was the um, tuition scheme. Mm -hmm. Grant learnt to play the drums that way. Neil, Neil learnt to play the guitar as well. So the house was kind of reverberated all the time. Uh, two, Scott would put on music and there would be a, an electric guitar and an amp. Um, it's not a very big house and you would get, the, I mean by this time they were all pretty good so it was fine. Neil would be in his bedroom doing the same and then Grant would be drumming and if you've ever heard Grant drumming, he's a super drummer but he's, he's heavy, it's, yeah. it's noisy. So. We had that in the house the whole time. Um, they were always involved, all three of them, um, in the in the, sh the the shows at school. Selkirk High maybe still does has a, had a super music department. Mm. So as he and your other sons got more and more into music, obviously a band came out of it, Frightened Rabbit. Were you happy about that, or were you thinking, when are you going to get real jobs? They all had wee bands at school with their friends and they played at school concerts and in, in some of the village halls round about Selkirk. Uh, and the music kind of he, it came about when he decided to go to Glasgow. He applied to the Glasgow School of Art because of the music scene. Um, and that was kind of when Frightened Rabbit was born. Um, and he did very well at Glasgow School of Art. Friendships were developing all the way along, mm. really close friendships right from the very beginning. Um, which he treasured. Yeah. Um, so he, yes, he went. He went to the Glasgow School of Art and started off with himself, and then himself and Grant. There were one or two other people who came and went, and that kind of went on right through to the to the end of, of did very well at Glasgow yeah. School of Art. And I remember going to his degree show, and he he presented me with this and his dad with this really sort of tape thing, you know, to listen, listen to this, listen to this. And to be honest, I thought it was, it was awful. <laughs> and that's me, Mum, I'm done with art. I'm going to, um, I'm going to do the band. And 
I, I, I was a bit horrified, but it, it didn't work out like that because he, he kept his art going right all the way through. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's what he, what he decided. So, um, and then Frightened Rabbit was forming by then. The name Frightened Rabbit, I get the blame for that. I don't, I don't think it was really, I think it, was, it wasn't a nickname that he had. But I will go on a wee while to talk about his shyness and his anxiety. So he, he was very, he was very anxious. Never mm -hmm. left your side when he was wee. You've spoken about his anxieties that were apparent to you from an early age when he was very young. But how did that develop? That sense that you had that he had struggles more than were common. Mental health struggles that were very particular. Scott was born in 1981 and um, he, w he was very, he was like a limpet really, just very, very clingy, but that, that's okay. You, you just think it's kind of normal, some, some people are shy, but it just, it just went on to night, he had night terrors, um, whereby he just, he would go to bed, because the, the house was buzzing at, at that time, it was light, everybody was around. But then he would waken up in the middle of the night, come through, and basically there was there was nothing we could do. I just we just worked around it, played musical beds like a lot of families did, um, and then his, his wee brother went in to the same room as him. And as I say, this went on until he was eleven. Mm -hmm. He 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 denies denied that, but he did. It was a long time, and it must have been. We used to joke that that he was terrified. His his bedroom was nearest the door by a millimetre and, and he, we used to joke that he had it in his head that, that somebody was going to come in and that would be the first port of call but it's, it wasn't really funny because it, mm. it was really very very real um, then it was time to start going to play groups and things like that and he he always used to talk about about social situations being very difficult for him and he literally just cried all the way there and eventually I just said, look, we're not, we're not going to bother with this at all. Um, but he had to go to school. He, he was clever and Scott found learning easy. Uh, but, and I would, I would imagine, I was obviously never in the classroom with him, but I would imagine that when he was in the classroom, he would be fine, he'd feel safe, he'd be secure, he could more or less do the work like any child, some of it didn't suit him, some of it did, but you know, I, I would think he would be, feel quite secure. But out in the playground must have been a total nightmare for mm, Scott. Mm. And he told the story later on, he hid it, you see, he hid it all. He told me the story later on that, and this was, when he, by this time he was 13, um, and in high school, and he used to pretend that he'd finished his work when he hadn't. And although this doesn't sound like a big deal, to him it, it was, because he was worried that they were going to laugh at him, or bully him, or and, and they were they were nice lads. They wouldn't have, they probably would have done neither. But this was all this was all the anxiety mm. it was building up in his head. Was it ever at the back of your mind that one day it might come out like this that he might choose to end his life? Not when he was a child. No. Um, I don't think that any help. I think I I think that possibly um, if he'd have got the right help whatever that was, and I don't know what that would have been, um, then it might have made a difference, it might not. But in 1981 and onwards um, into the 90s, there, there, there wasn't that help there. And, and to be honest, we never really thought that it was, it was, it, it, it was an issue. Um, maybe that was bad parenting, but you just, you just didn't. You just, you just did everything you could to make it easy for him and give him love and all the other things that, you know, and it was just normal family stuff. Yeah. Um, sports thing was another one. Uh, it was, which was, it's a real shame because he was he was a really good tennis player, but that was okay because he wasn't he wasn't having to interact socially or <coughs> as part of a team. But I did remember much later on. I, was, I watched the the boys all went to sort of football training on a Saturday morning. Neil and Grant got stuck in big time, and uh, and and Scott would hover about on the periphery, um, and he would have been really good at it if he hadn't been so anxious avoiding the ball at all costs because he was terrified that it, somebody passed it to him and he would, I don't know, fail or whatever. Mm. So there were all these, there were all these signs when yeah. he was growing up, when he was a wee boy. As you think back, do you think Scott was using his music to work out some of that angst, some of that stuff that was inside? 
I think it definitely was. I think um, if you've listened to, to, to the words and music, some of them are, are very dark, some of them are very funny. Um, but most of them work towards hope. Mm -hmm. There's a bench in Glasgow, and this is my favourite quote, from a, a song called Oil Slick. It was one of his favourite songs, and it said on it, we've still got hope, so I think we'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And there was always, always, there was very few that were so dark. There was always that element of hope. And, and, and I think that maybe gave him hope mm -hmm. and helped him. I'm pretty sure that writing the words and the lyrics, the, the, the words, the, the lyrics and the music, sorry, um, I think the, mu the music was often collaborative, but the lyrics were totally Scott. Yeah. Um, and yeah. the way that he did it, though, um, was that he he wrote them, he sung them, and then they were yours. Yeah, yeah. That you could do exactly what Put you like them with them, and that and that mm. the number of people that that, that helped. Yeah. Marion, first of all, of course, Scott was missing for some time and then uh, his body was discovered. 
can you think back to what you felt and all that you went through in those awful hours and days? I don't, I don't share a lot with people, um, but the, yeah, we, yeah, he was missing, as you say. He was missing for nearly two days. Um, I knew that I knew he'd gone. He'd gone missing before, and every time, and I, there were other times that I didn't know about. Um, and I'd seen I'd seen a lot of him in the last few months of his life, for which I'm really grateful. But I became more and more alarmed. And he, yeah, those those days were hard, but because he was well known. Um, we had a lot of publicity. But the one thing, the one thing that I remember, uh, and I've, I've said it before, but it was, we were in a room, we, we were in a hotel, we had waiting to hear, and we were all in a room, and I can still, I can see exactly where everybody was in that room right now. I can feel all the body language, I can see it. And there was the fe- that the air was completely electric with fear, um, and the, 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 we've got lots of lovely words that have come into the charity now. But the word that came to my head then was, "This is wrong," mm. and I, uh, that was it. Just this is wrong, and that I knew that one day that I knew that I would f- do something. I didn't know what that was. Um, obviously, you're in such a state. Um, you don't really know, but tiny changes was just um, two words in a line. While I'm alive, I'll make tiny changes to earth. Mm. Song we used to belt out at gigs the whole time, and that was a kind of that was a light bulb moment. Mm, that... But there was also comfort, you know, from some of th- some of the things that happened, mm, mm. and the fact that in our case, we at that point, the, we were, we got we got so much love and support. And everybody else felt the same. Mm. Um, lots of people came the, the day the Scott went missing. They all came down. They were came down to the hotel, and they were just they just wanted to be with us. Mm. They just wanted to be where he'd last been. Mm. Um, and there were people searching in Glasgow and Edinburgh and over in Fife and everywhere. And that, that, that helped a lot. You've quoted the line, Tiny Changes. And that, of course, is the name of the charity now. Can you tell us the kind of work that the charity is involved in? How did it come into being and what's it doing now? These few months after we, you know, after we laid him to rest, and, and you know, they, they're a bit of a blur. Mm. But we, we managed to get to the anniversary of his death, the first anniversary, and launch Tiny Changes. So what we did was we decided, first of all, what the focus has to be. We did look at um, the music industry, that world, where, the, as you say, there are a lot of, there's a lot of anxiety, depression, and leading to suicide. But anxiety and depression and loneliness can be a living death as well. So not just the ones who actually took their lives, but the ones that are still struggling. So, but we decided we would look at children and young people because that's the starting point of a life Mm -hmm. and everyone has the right to have really good mental health just to have a good life Um, and I I suppose in a way there was the the thought that if Scott had got the help he he wouldn't have needed it all the time but just to have somewhere to go in his head or physically or just nowhere to go when he was struggling I think, I believe I don't think we all do but I believe that 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 he would have had a good chance. Mm-hmm. Um, he was still a conf- he was still confused. He was still these other things. Like life would never be simple for Scott, and, and that you know, mental health or not. So, what kinds of things does the charity do to support people, particularly children and young people, through struggles with mental health? We're not a hands-on charity in the way that some are, where you you know you offer counselling and things like that, because we're, we're not we're not experts. So we, that was our start, one of our starting points. We're not experts. Yeah. We know nothing. Plus, we're a grieving family, so um, all of us, we just, you know, for virtually like a year and a half, until lockdown, 
we were never, I was never off that border train and the boys were the same, obviously fitting it in with other things, family and jobs, but um, just we just went to people in education, people in mental health, people in the in National Health Service, uh, anybody that could tell us basically what was good out there, what needed to be done, how to go about it, fundraisers, because that's one of the things that we do. Mm. Um, so all we have now really is a bank of knowledge. I mean, I just say that my, I was a teacher before, I did work with children with additional needs, but I've been retired 11 years. And the nearest I've ever got is loitering about in the, in the, the playground with my grandkids. So, you know, there's very little expertise there, but, um, and still isn't. So we had to build up a bank of knowledge and um, we decided on, on, our, on our focus, obviously to raise money through donations and events. And, and you know, to be honest, we've hardly had to do anything mm -hmm. because of the support that's come our way. People, <laughs> they had big events, small events. Kids had the events at school just to raise money. Jewelry was made, it was uh, artwork. We had support from like Coldplay, Paolo Nottini. It, it was amazing, mm -hmm. just what people were doing. And so that was the first thing to, to raise money. Um, raise awareness. We avoid now giving advice or pontificating about anything because we've acknowledged that really we don't know. So bring in the experts, let them see what they think, you know, people that are working in these areas, what mm -hmm. they think should happen. Um, just to use the voice that Scott gave us and also to involve young people um, in, every, in every part of the charity because what we've just launched recently is a small grants programme we actually did an emergency one for COVID, uh, but we just decided we had to do something because these charities that we supported financially might not have actually existed. Would have, you know, would have failed without the, the little bit of cash that we we gave them. Uh, but, but this is the one that we decided that, that we were going to start with, and we've launched a pilot scheme in the Scottish Borders where Scott grew up, and it's just invited young people, people who look after young people, organisations ideas for new projects and old projects, existing projects rather, um, just to put forward their ideas and we would fund them up to, mm. at, the, at the moment we've decided £5,000. Mm. So You've described the levels of support that were around for you at that time and so often we see the best in people through times of crisis. Would you say you saw something of that? A lot of people wanted to do something, mm -hmm. this, you know, just they, they didn't understand this. They were shocked, they were um, I suppose just the same as us, they, ju they just wanted to do something um, to help. But I think also people for themselves, just to try and make sense of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, Sir Scott was certainly in quite a dark place the last few couple of months of his life. Um, but the rest of the time he wasn't. Mm. That's the point. It was intermittent. Yeah. He had a good life. Yeah. This is a sad thing. You know, he, he, he had a great life and he followed his dream and he, you know, he reached out to people and um, it's, it's just so sad that, you yeah. know, he, you, he didn't have the help, he didn't, get, he didn't know no, where to go. No. As you think now about the work you're involved with in the charity and about the hope we have for Scotland to be better in this regard, are you hopeful? I think we can definitely make a difference, but I do think people like us and you that have got the voice are the ones that are going to... Um, we're not a political charity at all. No. There is no political ba bias uh, within the charity, but governments, whoever they are, are the ones that are the ones that can, let's be honest, make a difference. So I think... I mean, things are not in place. That's, that's a fact, you know, from what, what I've read and what I've seen. And uh, I think we need to make sure that that they get put in place as yeah. quickly as they can. And I think people like ourselves and you and other people that have got the voices have really got to shout. Mm -hmm. Because I don't, I mean, all, all the wee things that we're doing, tiny changes make big changes, they, it's all really useful. It's all really helpful and, 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 and telling people stories and, and building up this, this family. That, but in the end, I think things have got to be done. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, I do hope, I am hopeful, I really am. As we finish up, I want to say thank you so much for being willing to share today and for doing so with such courage and honesty. And I want to wish you and all those you work with through this work 
every blessing for what's to come. Marion, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Martin, for giving us the opportunity, giving me the opportunity to talk about this um, and reach out to all the people that, li that listen to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.